think of the recruiter as as your go-to, your ally in this because they want to help you because in return, it's going to help them. From a recruiter, talking to a candidate and saying, hey, these are some things that, that you should know. A lot of it is just how to, to specifically stand out. No one is really ghosting you to, to make it a, a personal attack. It's more of, there's just so many moving parts, really. All right, welcome, welcome, welcome back to this episode of the How to Get a Job podcast. Today is such an amazing episode because it's a really amazing topic and we have an amazing guest. Look, if you're a job seeker, have you ever really thought about like, you know, what goes through a recruiter said? What is a recruiter thinking? Have you ever taken the time to put yourselves in the shoes of the recruiter? And if you haven't, you for sure should. And that's why this we're doing this episode because I actually wanted to find a recruiter that can come and say, okay, here's what we think about. Here's what we talk about how we, when we look at red candidates and resume, here's how we decide who gets to interview and who doesn't. And I couldn't think of anybody better than Renee Bateman. Uh, Renee Bateman is now a career coach and she's also the founder of the, and the creator of the Renee, Renee, the career coach uh, business. Renee, welcome. How are you? Hey, Daniel, thank you so much for having me. Great I'm to super excited uh, to just talk to you about this. I think this is going to be an episode that people are really going to be enjoying, regardless of you're a college student or mid-career professional or a senior uh, or somebody senior in their career really looking to understand what does the recruiter think. Uh, but before we kind of get, get started, talk to us a little bit about your background, your experience and um, as a recruiter and now as a career coach. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think that anyone ever plans on becoming a recruiter. Uh, it's something that you kind of fall into. I actually went to school hoping to get into advertising and through a couple of jobs that just did not align with, with me and what I was really wanting, um, I used the power of networking, the power of who I knew to transition to a role that was uh, a recruiter role. And I was able to get in with a great company and really work my way up and know and see how the recruiter thinks. And it wasn't something that I was planning on getting into of, oh, I want to I want to know how recruiters work, but just the HR field really aligned with me. And after doing that for seven years, I realized that there's only so much that I can do as a recruiter mm -hmm. to help people in the process. You know, you can't really give a ton of feedback as to why they were rejected. And I, I realized that through talking with um, friends or family that wanted my feedback on their resumes as, you know, they're like, yeah. hey, you're a recruiter, you know, can you look over this? That's really what kind of uh, flipped the switch for me to be like, hey, I can help a lot more people than I could in the recruiting world. And so that's what led me more into becoming a career. I love coach. it. I love it. So, you know, what I'd be really interested to understand, okay, one thing is like people think like they're recruiters, they're just, they're all recruiters. But I found that there's really two sides of recruiting. There's internal recruiting and external recruiting. Can you like help us understand like what are the two major differences between those types of recruiting or recruiters perhaps? Yeah. So the, yeah, internal recruiting, that's going to be more of like you work in-house with a company, mm -hmm. right? So you're working for a company, let's say, we'll use a big example of Walmart, right? So you, you're you a recruiter, you work internally for Walmart, you're just hiring for Walmart. That's that's who you focus on, you, you speak to them. Then there's the external recruiters and they're kind of like the middleman, okay? So you have all these companies, maybe there's like five, six, seven companies that you're working with as a recruiter. And for all these different companies, the positions, you're you're kind of working there in the middle and finding the right people. So obviously you're you're trying to find the right people, whether you're internal or external, but it's just kind of the the workload and who you're representing based on internal versus yeah. The and I, and I think for me, like the biggest difference as if you're as a job seeker is understanding what is the goals and the motivation of each particular recruiter. Like an internal recruiter, they they generally have a high salary maybe a little bit of a bonus, an external recruiter have a low salary and they make commissions on all the placements that they make. 
And so because of that, it also incentivized them differently. And so you see a lot of more transactional conversation is happening when you're talking to an external recruiter versus when you're working with an internal recruiter. Like I, I think one of the things that I remember from like our PepsiCo, the, my, my time at PepsiCo is that the internal recruiters were really, really, really careful on the candidate experience because, you know, they knew that if they didn't treat it, like not everyone's going to get the job, right? Not we, everyone knows that, like, you know, and not every job seeker that applies to every job expects to get every single job. But if you treat a candidate wrong, that that candidate is also your client, is a consumer of your products. And so you want to make sure that you're treating them correctly. But um, and so I do think it's really important. And when you're talking to a recruiter as a job seeker that you c- c- can identify, is this an external recruiter? Is this an internal recruiter? Because the, the path to the job is a little bit different um, and they also have different motives. And, is, and so it's important to know that because it's treated a little bit different. Yes. That's such a good point. Yes, because with external recruiters, they are motivated by money, you know, more than the internal. And so they may not have your best interest in mind. They're just like, let's get somebody into this job so that I can get that pay. And there is, yes, exactly. There's that difference. And look, like anything else, there's pros and cons. I think one of the the pros of an external recruiter is the speed to, to the interviews. Generally, when, right, like, an, an, like internal recruiter, there's no sense of urgency sometimes. Like, you feel like you message them, they never reply, and then the, the recruiter will be like, oh, can you interview tomorrow? I'm like, I've been emailing you for three weeks and you don't reply to me. And then external recruiter, they'll be like, hey, they'll email you today, they'll do a screening today, they'll put you in front of the hiring manager tomorrow because it's all the speed, right? Because external recruiters get paid for placements. And so what happens, generally speaking, right, if a company, let's say Walmart, the same example, right, says, okay, I'm going to use a staffing agency, they'll, they'll use a handful of staffing agencies they have relationships with, and they'll have four or five different recruiting teams sourcing candidates, and it's whoever can get the best candidate as fast as possible in front of the hiring manager mm-hmm. gets the interview, and as soon as the hiring manager picks the person, they start right away. And so the speed <laughs> is so different than internal. It is. Exactly. Yeah. So let's, you know, I would say for, at least for, for, for my audience, I think most people work with internal recruiters, you know, because companies obviously want to try to keep as much of it internally. They don't have to pay that 15, 20, 30% sometimes fees. Uh, so let's talk about the internal recruiting side. I, 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 from what I see from your LinkedIn profile, and correct me if I'm wrong, did you do both? Because I see that on Cummins, you were internal recruiter. And is Corn Ferry, were you, is that more external or are you still doing internal? So Corn Ferry is very different in how they do it. So you are kind of the middleman, but instead of, like I said, having multiple companies that you're working with, um, through Corn Ferry, because they, they help with a wide variety of things, not just the, yeah. the hiring process, but all career development. But with them... Yes, like I was with yeah. Cummins, right? That was the last last um, company that I worked with for them. And Cummins was my sole client. It was as uh. if I was a Cummins employee. So I really took that on as like, yes, Corn Fairy gives me my paycheck, but I am hiring and I am fully Cummins. Oh, that know? makes awesome. Uh, that makes so. Okay, so I have a question for you. So, you know, when you look at different statistics and obviously every company is a little bit different, but every time there's a job posting, there's going to be, you know, on average hundreds of applicants. What's the recruiter's role in that? Like, how does the recruiter then determine who to interview, who not, who to phone screen? Like, walk us through that mindset that, that a recruiter goes through when they see, they turn on their computer and they see hundreds of applications. <laughs> Right. And, and there is some, we we have to be very strategic about this and, and not just, you know, start going A through Z. Okay. We, we really got to be particular about when a candidate applied and going first Mm. to last, you know, things, things of that nature. So we have to be very careful about that. So from a candidate's perspective, there is some advantage, you know, if you are first to apply because you're going to be first Mm -hmm. reviewed. One thing that that I kind of like to tell my my clients though is that if you're able to skip the line almost like yes you apply but if you're able to email somebody directly from the company and say hey I applied 
that recruiter wants to hire and, and they'll be able to skip the line going and finding that person's application because it's almost like you were referred or, you know, you reached out directly. So that's something that you may be like the hundredth person to apply and a recruiter may never really actually see your application. They may be to second phase or third phase before they get to that hundredth person. But if you're able to kind of stand out in a way that, you know, Hey, I applied and they go and find your application that can definitely pull you out of. So help me understand a little bit deeper. Like, okay, what if you if you're working 40 hours a week and you're recruiting, what is it, you know, and again, generally speaking, different companies, different recruiters, like generally speaking, what do you think those 40 hours look like from a typical recruiter standpoint? Oh, goodness. There's so much of, I mean, time blocking is huge, right? For a recruiter, because you have to focus on, yes, you're going through these applications. You're looking at the different positions that you're in charge of. And Truthfully, for a recruiter, they may have 20 positions that they're trying to fill for this company. And so, you know, if, if you're getting in contact with a recruiter and it's not just this one position they're trying to fill. So that's that's something important to know as well. But a lot of it is just going through the applications. The other part of it is that first round interview um, and making sure that those candidates align with what the hiring manager is looking for. Then the recruiter, they, they almost always have a really good relationship with that hiring manager because that hiring manager gives them the full list of what they, they want to hire. And so the recruiter keeps that in mind. They are sharing all those candidates with the hiring manager saying, hey, you know, here's a solid list of five or three. Who do you want to proceed with? And so when you're going through that interview process, that usually typically it's a first round interview with that recruiter. If you're able to make that that strong impression with them or really show that there's that solid alignment that you have, then they're going to be able to better portray that and communicate that to the hiring manager, therefore helping you get to yeah. that second round. So many things you, know? you oh, go ahead. I was going to just add like so many things that you share there are super important that I think we like as a job seeker, we forget is that like the recruiter is not just recruiting that role. And so you're like, Hey, I saw you posted this job. I'm interested in, in working there. Like, oh, okay, great. What role? But what role? <laughs> and so it's super important. If you will, first of all, if you are messaging the recruiter to attach the requisition number to that message, Right. Because that way the recruiter then can reference that back to say, OK, OK, oh, OK, they're going for the data analyst role. Got it. Honest. Uh, great. A another thing is like if you're doing you said uh, uh, sometimes 20 roles at a time. Think about that for your listeners out there. Think about how like how busy that is. That is 20 roles, hundreds of applicants per role. And they're all in different people. They're all in different stages, right? Some are just applications. Some are we're in the final rounds of interviews that they're managing. And then it's probably not the same hiring manager either. It's probably, if not 20 different hiring managers, maybe 10, but, but it's not exactly. the same manager. And different managers, it means different personalities. Some are faster to reply. Some are slower to reply. Some want more interviews than the other because they're like, they need more information to make decisions. Some are more involved and they want to see every single applicant. Some just say, hey, Renee, give me the top three. I trust you. Just, just send them to me, right? And so the recruiter is yes. managing all of this. And then do you not think they get a thousand messages on LinkedIn on top of all of this? <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I think for, for candidates, a lot of the times they think, okay, well, recruiter, they just focus on, you know, hiring these roles and they just talk to candidates all day long, you know, but there is so much more to it. And you, you bring up the great point of the hiring managers and those different personalities, how they handle things. So yes. And when you are emailing back and forth with your recruiter, one of the biggest things I say is, Make sure that you're not starting a new thread. Okay, just keep the same thread because that recruiter is that's going to make their life easier. Too. You know, and I think this is where, like, this is what I realized is like, you know, when when candidates are saying one of their biggest frustrations. So we survey a lot of job seekers, especially people in our program, and the biggest frustration they have is ghosting in the process. The reason why I want to bring this up is because I've never met a recruiter that has purposely ghosted somebody because, like, I just want to like be mean, like. It's never that way. It's just always things fall through the cracks because of the amount of workload that they have. 
And, and, and I think that's why I share this because you can avoid, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, and like, you can avoid getting ghosted when you humanize the process, when you actually have the relationship with the recruiter and you stop becoming applicant 347 and you become like, okay, Daniel Botero, the recruiter, I've been emailing back and forth. He's been really good at the communication. Like he's been on top of it. Like when someone, when a recruiter sees that you care, they'll actually like represent, like, like return that favor and say, okay, I'll reply. I'll give you the time. Um, but I think I, exp I wanted to talk through all that, like the amount of workload because recruiters are just slammed and they're pulled in every direction. And every candidate wants to feel like, like special. But the reality is that when you are managing 20 roles, 20 hiring managers, thousands of applicants, different times of the process, it's, it's really impossible to manage all that, which is why the ATS or the applicant tracking system is called the applicant tracking system. And it's not there to be your enemy. It's, it's to help track the process for the recruiters in the hiring team. Yes, exactly. What other insight yeah. would you, oh, go ahead. And yeah, you, perfect. You're going to say something? Oh, no, I was just going to go off yeah. the, the ghosting thing, because I feel like that's such a, a big thing. And a lot of people take that personally yeah. as like, oh, I've been ghosted. When really, you know, sometimes it, it, it can fall on the recruiter if they're just yeah. not well organized. You know, and things can fall through the cracks, but other things can, can they come into play too? Like it could be the hiring manager, like they are ghosting <laughs> the recruiter and therefore the recruiter's not getting any feedback. And so, you know, you reach out to that recruiter, you're like, Hey, what's up? And they, they just don't have any update because that hiring manager is not, not communicating with them. So there are a lot of moving parts and you said it perfectly there. No one is really ghosting you to, to make it a, a personal attack. It's more of, there's just so many moving parts. You know, really. how many times can you think, like, at least for me, like I can think of, of me seeing like a message on LinkedIn or an email. And I said, let me get back to this. Like, let me find out what's going on with this and I'll get back to it. And you forget that that message replies. So you actually end up like, I have this all the time on my LinkedIn, right? It's like, I open the message, I read it, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to reply. Then I get pulled in a different direction. I forget this message. And then a week later, I get somebody like a job seeker on LinkedIn, like, you ignore my message. I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, you know what? I'm sorry. Um, and I think that happens a lot with recruiters. And I think that's where, like, if you're listening to this, the reason why I say this, because I want you guys to humanize the recruiter to understand, like, these people uh, are there actually to help you. And their job is to find the right fit for the right, the right person for the right role and make the dots. No one's here. No, no, no recruiters evilly just saying, Hey, how many goes, how many people can I ghost today? How many people can I reject? Today? Like no one, no one feels good about like just rejecting you or ghosting you. Yes. Yes, exactly. What, what other insights do you think are important for a job seeker to, to know from a recruiter's standpoint or point of view? Oh goodness. There's, there's so many things that, yes, I wish I could just like peel back the curtain. And that's a lot of what I do with my clients is just peel the curtain back and say, Hey, this is really the moving parts here. This is how you can stand out. Um, yeah, as from a, from a recruiter talking to a candidate and saying, Hey, these are some things that, that you should know. A lot of it is just how to, to specifically stand out, you know? As I talked about before, you know, just try and skip the line in any way that you can, or put yourself out there, follow up as much as you can, and and don't make it like you're knocking on their door every day. You know, I, I typically say three to five days, um, but following up is one of the the biggest things that you can do to help you stay present in the recruiter's mind because again, they do have all these moving parts, and the candidates that show up the most is like, hey, I'm still interested. Hey, I'm still here you know, any update for me, things of that nature can really help. Um, but also just, you know, staying, um, staying on top of your stuff too, you know, as a, as a candidate and knowing, okay, like I've, I'm at this phase with this interview or I'm at this phase with this company that helps you in turn help them because you know, you're organized too. So there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts. Um, and I, I feel for the job seekers. I feel for the candidates that are trying to apply because yes, they're, they're not typically applying to just one company either. They've got a lot of moving parts. So, you know, just 
um you know bear with the recruiter yeah. on it <laughs> what would you say to <laughs> no the, like so I, I go give that advice to a job seeker and the reply is like but i don't want to be too pushy i don't want to like i don't want to follow up because i think i don't want them to think i'm annoying like what would your response to that if that's like the biggest yes i've heard that one before of you know i don't want to i don't want to come off too pushy to this this recruiter or i don't want to come off too and or too creepy or that that's I, another or too one I've desperate heard. That... what do you say to all those too desperate. Yes. There is a fine line. And that's why I say, you know, don't be that person that you're just knocking on their door every single day. Um, but, but I almost think of it like, like a dating scenario, yeah. you know, and if you're interested in somebody, they're interested in you. If, if you are following up and, and doing so in like a three to five day manner, if they're interested in you, it's not going to come off as creepy or, oh, you're too pushy. They're going to be like, oh, yes. Thank you for yeah. reminding me that that we've got this process to continue or, oh, yes, I do have to follow up with this, with this hiring manager. Sometimes it's yeah. a reminder to the recruiter of like, hey, I'm still here. And so it allows the recruiter to to proceed on their end because they may be mm -hmm. busy with the 19 other uh, positions. So I, I, you should never think of it as, oh, I'm just, you know, being too desperate or too pushy because if anything, it really helps the recruiter move things along and helps you be seen as an interested candidate. And that's what they want. They want somebody that's interested and not just passive as like, well, I didn't hear from you for, you know, two weeks. That's yeah. fine. No, they want somebody that's like, Hey, get me in this position. I'm excited yeah. about this role. No, I, I, it makes so much sense. So uh, my, let me pivot the conversation a little bit. So let, so as a recruiter, you like kind of review the applications. You then filter it down to a more manageable. You then generally set up like some sort of screening. Uh, it'd be a, maybe a phone call or a Zoom call or right now. Let's say that you 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 had the first or the first interview, the screening interview, you know, the first round, and you want to move them forward to the hiring manager. Uh, what advice do you have as candidates to ask recruiters to help them get ready for the next round? Mm, yes, this is huge because like I said, typically recruiters and the hiring managers are going to have a really good relationship. So that recruiter knows exactly what the hiring manager is looking for. And some of the best candidates, really the ones that, that came to me as the recruiter and said, okay, I'm, I'm going to this next round interview with the hiring manager. Like give me as much information that, that you can about that I can best prepare. What kind of questions do you expect them to ask? Um, and, and the recruiter can help you on that one. Um, questions about, you know, are there, is this going to be more situational questions, behavioral, or are we going to go more technical? Um, you know, just kind of get, get an idea of where the interview might, might take you and, and think about questions that, that you can straight up ask the recruiter and kind of get almost like a pre-cheat yeah. sheet <laughs> of, of how the interview is going to go down. And use the recruiter to your advantage yeah. on that. Because um, if you just think, okay, well, the recruiter is kind of off limits or this this might be, you know, seen as like, I'm, you know, digging too much. No, not at all. Um, the recruiter, if anything, we love to get the positions filled. So if that candidate can stand out to that hiring manager and and really be, um, you know, top candidate for them, then then all the better. Sometimes as a recruiter, I'll try and give that information. You no, know, but if, if somebody's coming to me as a candidate and asking for it, I'm like, oh, yes, we've got a good one here. I, I want to add to I love, love this advice because I think this is probably one of the biggest low-hanging fruits for any job seeker. If So think about the recruiter's job, right? They're recruiters to fill these jobs. And recruiters are human just like you and I and anybody listening to this. And they obviously care about their job and they want to look good and they want to do a good job. So if a recruiter moves you forward to the next round and they've given you their blessing, it is now in their best interest that you get that role. Because if the recruiter then gets the reputation as someone that like, oh, okay, anytime Renee gives me somebody, they're a superstar, right? Or if, if Renee sends me three candidates, I know for a fact one of them is the person I'm going to hire. Like it, it makes Renee look good, then she's going to be happy with it. And, and that applies to any recruiter. 
And so once you go through the interview and the rec and and you know generally you, I, I encourage you to ask your a final question relating to asking for feedback. And Renee, if Renee was interviewing me, and she says, you know what, Daniel? No, I think everything is great. I'm going to set up the next interview with the hiring team. So please be on the lookout for an email to 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 coordinate some time. You've kind of already gotten the acknowledgement of you moving to the next round. That is the perfect opportunity to be like, hey, Renee, I'm so glad that you feel that way. I can really see myself building a career. I comments. I do have a question. What advice do you have for preparing for the next interview? What can I expect? What should I research? How can I prepare? Right? Because now is Renee's best interest that I do well. I will now represent as the interviewer, represent Renee. If I go to that interview, imagine this worst case scenario and best case scenario. Worst case scenario, I get to the interview and I start cursing the hiring manager. Like, I hate this company. You freaking suck. What do you think the manager is going to be like? He's going to end the interview and he's going to send an email to Renee and Renee's boss and be like, what are you doing? Why would you get this person in front of me? Like, right. And it's going to reflect terrible on Renee, but, or the recruiter, right? On the flip side, if you go and do amazing, same thing, right? The hiring team is going to be like, Renee, recruiter, where did you find this person? This person is amazing. Like you're so good at your job. Like, um, and so they are your ally. <laughs> they are. Yes. That is number one. Like really think of the recruiter as, as your go-to, your ally in this, because they want to help you because in return, it's yeah. going to help them. If exactly. you get the job, they don't have to do any more screenings. They can move on to the next 19 other roles exactly. they have to fill. <laughs> Exactly. So one more yes. scenario and we wrap it up. Okay. So worst case scenario, Renee, you pass me forward to the next round. I go through the final round of interviews. There's three candidates and the high, and then you send me an email saying, Hey, Daniel, unfortunately the hiring team says they loved you. Think you're a good cultural fit, but there was just someone slightly better fit. What do you advise me to do? Do I just give up? What what do I do now? Like, or do I, you tell me. Okay. I love this scenario because as a recruiter, I saw this turn in the favor of the candidate that got rejected so many times. I kind of think of this as like, like you're not, you're not out. If anything, this can align you perfectly for the hidden job market, as yeah. I like to call it, because that hiring manager, we'll call him Bob. Bob loved you as a candidate, but there was somebody that just was a better fit for that role. I have specifically had that hiring manager come to me and say, hey, we really love Daniel, but I, I can't hire him for this role. I'm going to open a, a position next week and I want to hire Daniel. I want to pull him. So we'll, we'll kind of do some rough round or like, you know, he's already interviewed, but we still have to do some, you know, basic interviews with him. And if, if all continues to go well, we're going to hire Daniel for this position. And in this case, in this situation, they don't even have to post the role. So it's saving them time, saving them money and, uh, hiring managers and the hiring team love to go this route. They love to pull those candidates that really did well. Um, on the flip side, I have had candidates that they get, you know, ex nade at round you know, they're third or second in line and they just blow smoke and they're just like, you know, yeah. screw you, you know, and, and just like let it all out. And we're like, man, you did so well in the interview. If you would have just held on a little bit longer, we would have pulled you for another role. So if you are down and out, you know, as, as we would say for, you know, you got X made for that role, but you're, you know, second in line then you are still in such a great position to to make it in with this company, whether that's in a month from now or a week they contact you. So keep that relationship. That's also yeah. something else is they obviously admired you and really appreciated you as a candidate. So don't just like, oh, well, I'm never going to talk to them yeah. again. You know, really keep that relationship going because Again, they could contact you for another opportunity. I'm so glad that you, you see it the same way I do in this scenario because I think that's, again, big, big mistake 99% of job seekers make is they're either A, the most common way is like a recruiter, like you get the rejection email and they say, okay, thank you so much. And that's it, right? I, I think there is those scenarios where people blow up, but the vast majority just say thank you or don't do anything at all, right? And I think you're right. I think like you, you again, 
this is why it's so important you guys understand the other side of the table and like being inside the recruiters and the hire managers uh, head is so important because you don't know what else is going on in the organization. You don't know if there's more roles coming up in two, three months. You don't know if there's other departments that need that skill set. Um, I have two different examples that's happened to people in my program. One, this guy was interviewing for a role at Salesforce. Uh, went to the final round, same scenario. Hey, we liked you. There was just someone with a little bit better fit. And so we decided to go with that person. Right. So this person in my program, he knows to follow up and say, hey, thank you for your time. Is there any particular is there any roles that you think I'll be a better fit for? Right. The recruiter said, hey, thank you so much for following up. I reached out to the hiring manager and the hiring manager said that his friend is a hiring manager in another like department. And he actually is looking for someone with your skill set. So the recruiter then set that up. Final interview. Got the job. Would have never happened if you didn't just say, hey. Uh, you know, thank you so much. I totally understand. I can really, I st you know, I still see myself building a career with your organization. Is there any other opportunities that you think I'll be a better fit for, right? So either the recruiter or the hiring manager can take 10 seconds to see, is there any other roles that we think this person is a good fit? Because look, if you're listening to this podcast or watching this on YouTube, you have to understand that companies love to hire good people and it's so hard to find them. And so if you've already been vetted, you can do the job, you're a good cultural fit, you would have never made it this far. And so they don't want to waste talent. So by you having them second guess themselves on other roles, not that role, they might not change their mind. That will allow you to like be put, put into different roles. And you also don't know, there's so many things that happen. Like, okay, let's say you, you got second place, somebody else got the role. Well, what if the other person was also interviewing with somewhere else and they took the other job and changed their mind? What if that person failed their drug test? What if that person failed their background check? What do you think they're going to do? They're going to, because you ended so nice, they're going to be like, hey, the role ended up being open again. Are you open to coming back? And so you just don't know. So you're much better off killing them with kindness, leaving the door open, letting them know that you're open to future roles and stay in the communication. Even if the role doesn't happen today, it could happen three months from now. And just to finish one last story on this, different client, different scenario, interview for a role at Bloomberg. The final round, same thing, second best, third best, didn't get the role. Well, the, uh, somebody else got the role. Well, the hiring manager was actually interviewing with IBM. And literally, she stayed in touch with the hiring manager. The, uh, the hiring manager went from Bloomberg to IBM. In IBM, she was tasked to build her own team, reached out to that person she interviewed and said, hey, I, I, I couldn't tell you this before, but I actually think you'd be a better fit for my team in IBM. <laughs> Would you just, and there was no interview. Would you like to come work here? Because one of my contingencies when I came to IBM was that I could build my team. And I just wanted to just bring you in right away. And, and that comes down to building those relationships. Yes, I love that. Yes, because that's the other thing is networking and companies. There's so much overlap that I think candidates don't always think about. So yes, if you do a great job, the overlap into another company is huge. But on the flip side, you know, companies talk and, and people talk and you may have left a really bad reputation over at some company. And, you know, then a hiring manager is like, oh, actually, I have a friend that used to work over there. Let me see how, how good of a worker they are. And if they don't yep. have a, a great recommendation for you, that can really sour yep. it for you. So yes, there's your connections with people in, in your job hunt. Absolutely. So Raina, I know I, I, we, we, I, I told you 30 minutes and we're already over 30. So I want to be super respectful of your time. So before we wrap it up, you know, if people listening to this really enjoyed this talk, really want to learn more about you and the programs that you provide, can you share us a little bit more about what they are and how to best get a hold of you? Yes, I have. You can find me just about anywhere. I'm over on LinkedIn, um, Renee Bateman. I'm also on Instagram and you can find me Renee, the career coach, uh, as well as YouTube. I, I post continual videos, you know, again, pulling back that curtain for different uh, potential candidates and, and things like that. I also just created a program, career elevation program, where I'm really pulling that curtain back and showing the six proven methods to help candidates get hired and showing you everything that you need to know from a recruiter 
perspective and now career coach. So you can find me on, on any of those, uh, Renee, the career coach.com. Perfect. So I'm going to put the links to your LinkedIn and your website as well. I'm and then from your website. I know there's links to everything else, but we'll put those links in the show notes. So if you definitely encourage you, look, if you're, if you're listening to this, if you enjoy this, um, if you know anybody that wants to, that's currently applying for jobs and should learn the information we talked about, how to understand the recruiter's mindset, right? Share this episode with them. And if you found value in it, all I ask is that you please uh, leave us a review um, on anywhere that you listen to this. Uh, Thank you so much for everyone for listening. Renee, thank you so much for being here. And I'll talk to you guys on the next episode. Bye.